Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. It's still a bit early, and yes, this party was good, I know. Um, but well, the only thing standing between your next cup of coffee and yourself is me and this talk. Um, so bear with me, uh, I'll bear with you. Um, my name is uh, Martin Mildes. I work at a Dutch company called Info Support. I will not bother you with the details because, well, that's not why I'm here. Why I am here is to tell you a bit about Elasticsearch, Rockstash, and Kibana and the things that I did with this tooling at a major Dutch bank. So the program is about Elasticsearch, Rockstash, and Kibana. There will be a quick introduction to start with. I'll dive into the use case with the Dutch bank. And at the end, obviously, there's room for questions, and I hope to be able to give you some answers. Anyway, um, the LK will on the program, it's not a Renio, as we see here. This is a male one, I'm told. I'm no expert, but they say so. Um, the LK is about Elasticsearch, which is basically a, a document database, uh, which allows you to do very quick lookups, very well uh, structured. Um, it's about Logstash, which is a tool to uh, scrub your logging, to pass it, to uh, process it, and it's about Kibana, which is all about pie chart, graph charts, bar charts, all the kinds of charts that we might wish to use. And if you put them together, you have Logstash, which is used to collect logging data from your application. You've got Elastic, or Elastic Search, it's called Elastic by now, which is used to store and analyze your logging information. And there's Kibana, which we primarily use for visualization purposes. And if you put them together, it might more or less look like this. This is what you can do with it. Um, uh, this might look pretty impressive, uh, but it all starts with this, which is pretty simple. Uh, it's just basically a log stash configuration file saying, this is, my, uh, this is my log file, let's see there, and I want to copy it to another place. Okay, well, that doesn't give you this, obviously, but that's where it starts, and to get a better idea, we need to dive into the details. And we'll primarily look at Logstash because that's where most of the magic is happening. So, Logstash, as I said, it's a tool that you can use to process, to analyze your logging data. And it's very modular in its setup. There's a lot of modules that add various ways of processing input, of filtering your input, of processing your output. Um, Let's take a look at some of those modules. For inputs, you can have obviously just regular log files, you know, a text file on disk. But there's also things like syslog, or standard in, or XMPP, log4j, appenders, uh, sockets, IRC, whatever you can think of that contains some kind of information, you can process it with logstash. Next is filtering. And filtering is basically um, a lot of modules like extracting semantics from your log lines. You can think of a, a geographic information, if you've got an IP address, you can look it up in a database. Um, you can add information or remove information from your uh, log lines. You can try to match certain parts of your log lines against known patterns such as dates or IP addresses, numbers, host names, user agents whatsoever. And finally, there's a lot of ways to output your, your data. You can send your events to other systems. You can think of graphite, elastic shirts like we're using here. But you can even have configuration rules for uh, emailing uh, certain events, uh, outputting to other files, as we saw in the very basic example, uh, putting back to standard out, uh, sending to IRC, Jira, NGOS, S3, whatever you can think of, you can send your logging information there. Elastic then is well, basically used for storing the logging information. Um, as I said, it's a search and analytics engine. It's very well scalable horizontally, so you can easily add more nodes to your setup to increase your processing power. Um, it stores the logging events like some kind of JSON-like documents. Um, so that's very uniform and it allows you to, to perform very simple queries on your documents. And you can, be, uh, you can uh, send your queries along with filters um, for, uh, to have them process the right way. And that's a feature that tools like Kibana use for uh, not, having to do that not having to do that themselves. So they'll be able to just get the data they want from Elastic. Then Kibana, finally, 
uh, it's, it's mainly the dashboard, so it's, it's therefore for, uh, for uh, visualization purposes. Um, it's written in HTML and JavaScript, and that's actually all you need, because the dashboard configuration is stored in Elastic as well. Uh, so it's you, you don't need anything else. You don't need an expensive sort of, uh, web application server. <laughs> And Kibana actually has two main concepts. The first of them is filtering, where you de determine what data is used to actually build the dashboard. And the second that you need is queries, which are like some kind of labels. So you can add a label to certain logging documents or events that you got from Elastic. And these can be used to, um, for example, build the charts. So, as I told you, um, the main part of the talk will be about the real world use case that we did at a major Dutch bank, the bank is called IMG. It's, in fact, uh, the largest bank in the Netherlands with an estimated market share of around 40%. And we did the implementation at a part of the internet banking system. Well, you can say it's kind of a web scale system. They have more than 1 million customers, the bank. At least that's what Wikipedia says, and Wikipedia is always right. Um, and uh, they have very hip, uh, high peak volumes, uh, especially during certain uh, times of the year, certain times of the months. Um, uh, the one million customers, by the way, are per hour, not in total. Uh, just, just to make sure. Um, and the part where we did this setup was for um, the part where you have to authorize your transactions. So if you, have a, if you want to transfer money to somebody else, you enter the transaction details into the web page, uh, like I want to transfer this amount, um, I want to uh, transfer it to that person with this IBAN. Um, and just to make sure that you are really the owner of the bank account, the bank sends you a code by short message on your phone. Or if you don't own a mobile phone, you can get a paper letter at home with 100 codes. And they'll tell you send me code 69 or code 42, and you have to look it up on your paper list and enter the code. So they know you're the owner of the bank account, and after this final authorization is there, the transfer will be made. So, what does it look like? Well, um, initially you might think uh, this is pretty good setup. Um, I see that there's a. No, it's not moving, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the Kibana hut, um, but it's also on the white on, on the wall. Um, well, initially you might think, um, well, this application has four nodes in the production environment. So we have four times uh, log search process. Uh, we have one elastic search process over there, and then we have Kibana doing the, uh, the filtering and processing. And I'm in the visualization. Well, that would be nice. Um, however, um, the company that uh, built and distributes Elastic uh, recommends you to do it this way. Um, we do Redis there, but it's not required, you can use anything else. But this X first is kind of a buffer, so that just in case you didn't scale Elastic well enough, you're not flooding the Elastic cluster. Um, secondly, uh, you can send your data there, and then this one can do some post-processing, which can also be, well, useful, uh, especially if you have a lot of different heterogeneous systems all sending their logging data to the same elastic, which was in fact happening at the bank. And it's not only that they are written in different languages and different stacks, but they were even running in different time zones, for example. Now, what happens if a system in London says it happened at 12 o'clock and my system in Amsterdam also said it, it happened at 12 o'clock? Well, that is a two hour difference. So, uh, among other things, this process, um, uniforms all the timestamps in logging messages so that they would be in the same time zone before being stored in Elastic. That is very useful because that means you can correlate logging events from one system and another system based on their timestamp and some other factors, <coughs> which wouldn't be possible if the systems would have had their own timestamps which might differ for two hours or something. So, um, let's dive into the large test setup. As I said, um, it's, it's a tool that merely processes the logging data. We, we did a lot of uh, processing, actually. Uh, the first thing we did is we add a lot of information to each and every log line of our application. We added things like, which is the actual host name that I'm running on? Um, which environment am I in? Test, UAUT, 
production, pre-production. What is the name of my application? Useful because there are a lot of applications sending their data to the Elastic Cluster. Secondly, we removed a lot of information. And this might sound a bit strange. Why would you remove logging information? <coughs> it turned out that some of our logging statements contained actual very sensitive data. Remember, it's a bank, so there's things like uh, money flowing from persons to persons. Um, and that's actually very, um, a, that's a big privacy concern. You're not allowed to see that even if you're working at a bank, you're not allowed to see that. And by logging it to a file, it's no problem because the server where the application is running is secured by passwords, etc. But if I'm actually taking the log file and shipping it to an elastic cluster, which is not secured, but visibly to anyone in the bank, I'm actually leaking data. By that time, it was already an issue. By now, if you're in the Netherlands and you have a data leakage, you risk a fine, which is defined as a percentage of your annual turnover as a company. If you're a big bank, that's a lot of money, and you do care about that. So it's important to remove all these things, like uh, IBAN, identification, amounts, um, transfer descriptions, and the like. Uh, finally, we did, uh, we did also some, some transformations because some information in our logging was very structured, like se semicolon separator or something, um, but that's not the way that it's very useful to process it with Elastic and Kibana, so we did some transformations to make it more fit into the document-like structure. And then in the end, we would just ship each and every log line to Redis. Then there's the second log stash I'll set up. I'll just run through that quickly. It just reads events from Redis. It fixes the time zones. Um, if logging information came in using XML, it was somehow transformed to JSON, and then it was sent to Elastic. This was already there, and we didn't actually need it because our application was doing fine, but oh, it was there for other um, uh, applications. Uh, and then we have Elastic. Uh, as I said, it's uh, very well scalable. Um, well, uh, that was actually also being done. We had five um, data nodes, so that's the, the, the nodes in the cluster that actually contain data. Uh, and there was one access node. The access node did not contain data, but it was a member of the cluster. So it knew if you would do a query, where to find the data, retrieve the data from the other node in the cluster, combine it and send it back to the client. That's actually a recommendation to set it up that way for large clusters so that you don't uh, flood the cluster members. In total, the cluster had like uh, 300 gigabytes of RAM, which is, well, quite a lot. Um, they would, um, <coughs> excuse me, they would uh, process around 73 million events each day. Um, and by the time I made the presentation, there was about 3 terabytes of information, but well, with 73 million events each day, it's still counting. Um, after one month, the logging would be cleaned up, so it's growing slowly, but still is growing. One month of history, and the Elastic Access node also hosted the Kibana files and the storage of the dashboard configurations. <coughs> So, as for the Kibana configuration, um, as I said, we have, a, we have a filter to determine what information was to be included in the dashboard. And this filter was primarily based on the environment that we wanted to monitor uh, and the timestamp. We always wanted to see the last 24 hours. We got a bit of a fight with the team that operated the cluster because um, um, these indices in Elastic are uh, timestamp based and by, query, by filtering the last 24 hours you always hit two indices which is well not good for performance because Elastic likes it when you use just one index and we always used two indices <coughs> but well we, we were responsible for maintaining a system running in production it, that's, that's the devil's thing right you, you, you build it you run it so that means that if, it's, if, it, if it fails, we want to know. And if we get in the office by 8 o'clock in the morning, we want to see what happened last night, even if that happens to be in another index. So we, we kept it that way, although the operations team didn't quite like it. The dashboard would be automatically refreshed 
uh, we had it projected on a large monitor that was at the wall, so we could easily see what was happening in production. And we defined uh, some errors, uh, I mean some queries for um, certain things that could happen, like this log event describes an error that occurred, or <coughs> describes a warning that occurred. But sometimes we had specific uh, problems in the system, and we wanted to see how often that happened. So we described queries for matching exactly those logging events that indicated the problem was occurring, so that we could easily see in a chart how often did it happen last week or hours or last month or whatsoever. Uh, and then we decided to use the rows and panels from Kibana, and you can see that in the, uh, in the big picture, so that we could optimally use uh, the whole screen because otherwise you would have one long screen and you would need to scroll it, that's not very useful. So, um, that's it about the, uh, the tools. Let's dive into the Logstash configuration because as I said, that's where most of the magic is happening. <coughs> we started with this. Um, this describes the input of the Logstash process and as you can see, it describes um, that it should watch two files. One is the application login and one is the so-called audit logging. This audit logging was the one with the sensitive data, and we'll see in a few minutes how we did that. Um, we also defined that the application logging, which is just the, the technical logging, so to say, um, is uh, sometimes has multi-line log events, which means if you, for example, if, if, there, if an exception occurred, you get a stack trace, right? Um, and you want to keep all the lines of the stack trace within the same log event. If you do not do that, um, Logstash will see it as uh, individual log events with just, uh, well, one package name and class name. Well, that's not very useful. You can't process that. And by saying, if it starts with a timestamp, uh, no, if it does not start with a timestamp, then it belongs to the previous line. And timestamp is just a predefined pattern from Logstash that you can, well, reuse. So every log line should start with a timestamp, and if it does not, it, it belongs to the previous line and should be considered one. Um, oh, and it's good to mention, um, we also um, label both files. One is called the application log, and the other one is called audit log, because while processing, in the processing step of Logstash, you can't see which file actually um, generated or contained uh, the line that you're processing. So the filtering step, well the application is, it does not need a lot of uh, processing. We say if a log event comes in and its type is application, um, well then we can use the grog filter. And grog is all about matching uh, lines to specific patterns and extracting the parts of the line that match a pattern. So we match the message line, which is predefined by the file uh, input. And we say that if it starts with a timestamp, you need to store it in the timestamp field. There's some kind of data between square brackets, um, which we call the log level, and you need to store it in the log level. Oh no, the, the, this data is another thing, sorry. We have a log level, which is also a predefined pattern, debug, info, warning, error. Store it in the level field. Then we have some kind of Java class pattern, well, obviously interesting as well. Uh, and then the rest of the line, the rest of the message is being stored in the line. And then we remove the message because, well, we actually took all the relevant information from it. Well, the audit logging is a bit more interesting. Um, up here is an example of what it might look like. I hope it's also readable if you're at the last uh, rows. Great. As you can see, it also starts with a uh, timestamp, a thread name, uh, log level. Then here is an, uh, a Java class that generated the message. And that is the message, which is uh, some kind of key value structure with event ID, IN channel, OD beneficiary account. These are the keys, and they have values, and they are separated with tilde by tilde. I don't know why it's still the pipe tail. It was written that way before I joined them. Um, but, well, you need to deal with that. So, uh, and there were a lot of more, uh, a lot more um, uh, fields, but this is just for the basic ID. 
Uh, and as you can see, here is OD beneficiary account, which means something like order detail, beneficiary account number. Oh, well, and this is, this is an IBAN. It's the Dutch uh, state bank account, uh, so it's no secret to display it here. Everybody knows that. Um, but, uh, by the way, they have bank account number one. How cool is that? I want bank account number one as well. Um, so they have, uh, so we need to strip that properly because we're not allowed to leak that data into a non-secured system. Um, and here at the end, and I hope that it will all fit on the beamer. No, it does not. That's a shame. Um, here, in the end, there's the, the, the final log event. And as you can see, it has one field by now, which is called message, and it just is the whole line that we have there. So, first, let's do some pattern matching with drop again. We take the message field, we extract the timestamp, well, we're not interested in the spread name, we have the log level, it's not interested because it's always the same, uh, we have the job class, it's not interesting, and we have the rest of the line which we will keep as audit message, and then we remove the original message. Great. Now, we have got a new document over here. It has got a field that is called timestamp, and there's out this message with the rest of the line. Looks good. Next step. We're going to do some mutations on um, the log event. We're taking the audit message field, and we're replacing tilde by tilde. It's all escaped, right, for readability. And we replace it with a backtick. So now we've got the same log event at the bottom with audit message, event ID, backtick, IAM channel, backtick, and then there's the other fields, but they just dropped off the beamer. I'm oh, sorry for that. Um, but you have to trust me, there is still the OD beneficiary account below there, and that's still not good. Next step, let's apply the KV filter. KV is for key value. Um, we take the audit message field, which had like uh, uh, key is value, backtick, key is value. We split it on the backtick, and everything before a backtick is now the key, everything behind the backtick is now. I, I'm, everything bef um, if you split it on the backtick, you get key is value, key is value, and then it's being split on the equal sign to separate the key and the value. So that looks good because now we have a timestamp a field that's called event ID and it has got the value that was defined over there. And below is still IN channel and OD beneficiary account. And then we remove the audit message field. If we would not do that, we would still leak the sensitive data out of our secured system. Because it would still be in the audit message field, it would be in the document, it would be shipped to Elastic. Not good. Finally, um, uh, if a field starts with OD, which is again order detail, then it's on the blacklist and we remove the field. And that's the most important part because there we remove all the sensitive information because they were happened to all be in OD yada yada fields. Um, but if, if you would have had a situation where it was not with a predefined name, or you could easily add more names to the blacklist, obviously. And then the log event would be the timestamp, the event ID. The IAM channel would still be there, because it doesn't start with OD, and the OD beneficiary account would be removed. Well, great. So far, so good? Not completely. Because what happens if, for example, the grok filter fails because you have a syntax error or something? then the whole filtering part is skipped for the rest and you just move to the output and that means that you would still have for example the message field in your logging event and it's still going to elastic oh no we can't have that so the final filter step was that we checked if there is a tag in the log event called underscore grok parse failure okay let's just make sure that we clean up after ourselves remove the message remove the audit message, better safe than story. It's better to have a log event with no information that will tell us, hey, something went wrong in processing, than having a log event 
with, hey, uh, John uh, transferred 50 euros to Elisa, that's not good. And then finally, we would use the output uh, uh, module for Redis, uh, look up the Redis host and put our log event in there, and it would be picked up by the <coughs> other log test process. Okay, um, well, finally, uh, then if, if you do all this and you, and you create a nice dashboard, you can build something like this. Um, this is what, what I've been looking at every day for two years or something. Um, among code, happily, uh, next to code, I mean. Um, what did we see here um, at the bottom was a big panel with individual log messages. So just the first 500 of them, um, and which allowed us to easily look what was happening in the production environment without actually uh, logging into the server because it's a bank. You're not even allowed to log into a production server even though you're a DevOps team. You're not allowed to log into your own production server for security reasons, right? I mean, I could see all kinds of sensitive things there, not allowed to. Um, but doing it this way, it is allowed because we made sure that all sensitive information was done. Then this panel contains um, uh, just the calls to the application um, on both servers. We have, as I said, we had four servers. We had two data centers with two servers in each data center and always one of the data centers was active and the other was passive. So the, this showed the green and the orange cell in the active data center and every couple of months they would be switching data centers and we would update the dashboard configuration. Very cool. Um, and this chart uh, showed us the warnings and the errors uh, if they would occur. Um, this is, uh, oh no, this is, uh, I'm, I'm saying it wrong. This is the, the total traffic on each node this is the number of messages on each node, so that's all logging information, and this is the warnings and the hours. And then here we have uh, three uh, different calls that would be performed on the application, um, and we uh, divided all the calls, not per cell in the data center, but per call, per operation that the application supported. And then in the upper row there would be um, like a spread out of what type of transactions were uh, processed by the system. That's not really necessary for production support of our operations, but it was actually fun to see, okay, what kind of transactions are we actually processing as a bank? So, I've got a few questions for you, because you can ask questions to me at the end, but now I'm going to ask you a few questions to you. What do we see here? One node dies, the other one rises. One node dies, the other one rises. That's not working, then the one colors are both. Close, but no cigar. Well, it's not like one node is dying, another one is taking the work from the other one. Well, more or less, but it was a control die. We just did a, a deployment into production. And since the application was behind the load balancer, we just brought that down one of the nodes. It's not actually dying, it's more like murdering maybe. Um, we killed it on purpose to install a new version of the application. Um, then we would bring it up and the load balancer would switch to both machines. Then we would bring down the other cell, de deploy the new version as well, and bring it up again. And as you can see, there's small peaks where the load balancer was like, okay, what am I gonna do right now? Okay, well, and then in the end it, well, more or less settles and both are equal in load. Okay, another one? Great. What do we see here? As I said, this is the uh, total number of logging events per uh, server. This is the um, spread out of the different operations and in this chart we see warnings and errors overall in the whole system. Failure. Yeah, fa failure. Because there were some errors you have less operations in the system. Okay, exactly, it's just a minor disruption in the system. Um, appears to be in our system because it's not only uh, less traffic 
but uh, there's also errors being logged. Well, it turned out in the end the error wasn't exactly in our system, but it was in communication with another system, some kind of JMS error or something. But it meant that we did not process the transactions. So that shows us that we have less operations succeeded. But you don't see a difference in the messages chart because, well, there is being logged. And uh, all the logging altogether uh, uh, is more than the, the minor disruption over there. Okay, this one is a bit more difficult, maybe. We, um, we zoomed out the chart to about one week, by the way. So as you can see here, these are different days in the week. Is Well, indeed, there's, there's a clear, uh, you can clearly see the nice where almost nobody does this banking. Well, that's a good thing. You're not supposed to do banking at night. Apparently, but, at some point, the system is overloaded or anything. Exactly. There, there's, there's quite a peak over there, right? And you also see it with the orange operation there, the orange uh, call that we support. Um, what actually was happening here, um, it's um, the last week of the month of May. Uh, if you live in the Netherlands, it's your favorite week of the year, except for Christmas, maybe. Um, because in, uh, May of, in the month of May, uh, you get your wage, plus an additional 8%, which is called the holiday bonus or something. But it's 8% of your yearly wage. So what did we see there? People started frantically logging in, seeing if they already got their wage plus bonus. <laughs> And when it was there, yay, transfer to my savings account. And that happened to be there. I think a couple of big companies did their wage payments. And everybody transferred to the savings account. And maybe some people book a holiday or something. But practice is that a lot of people actually just move it away to another account. OK, the last one. What's this? Uh, and by the way, the time scale is uh, 12 o'clock midnight, 8 o'clock the next morning, so to give you an idea. Is it a football match? Yeah, football match. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. Actually, it hurts for me because, well, as you might know, we're not participating in the Euro Championships. Uh, this was uh, the, um, the FIFA World Cup 2014. Netherlands playing against Chile, 2-0 to zero for the Netherlands. Um, and as you can clearly see, the match started around 5 p.m. And everybody was like, I don't care about banking, I gotta see the match. But somehow, during halftime, people are interested in their, in their banking. I don't know what you do during halftime, I get an additional beer or something. Oh, let, let's, let's check my banking. And then, oh, the well, match continues, so not interested anymore. And at around 9 or 10, after the party has ended, because, well, 2 to 0 is a nice result, well, the old traffic just catches up again. And <coughs> it slows down for the night, and then in the morning it gets back up. So we did a football match, and we came in the office the next morning, still a bit groggy about, okay, it was a great night, great match. And then we saw this, and we were like, this can't be true. This is, this is like, well, if, if you mention big data, this is what you expect with big data, seeing patterns that you did not expect before, and well, we saw one over there. So anyway, that's it for me. There's plenty of room for questions, so I suppose you all have a lot of questions for me right now. I have a couple. This one is uh, the Redis stuff. Yeah. Was this story in the Redis? Is, is using the public subscribe ready, or just storing the data there as a, as a map set of uh, regarding the, the Redis setup, we just pushed the data there and expected somebody else to uh, retrieve it from there. Okay. So we didn't really know about the Redis setup, we just knew we were supposed to set it there and it would somehow end up in Elastic. Mm -hmm. And I did some research to find out how they processed it, what was the second process. So, and let's see, there's. Uh, It just sends it as a list to Redis. 
on a specific key and then <coughs> expect some other process to pick it up there. Uh, the other is, is probably something I can find in the manual, but I, I have something in my mind. You can, in the logs, that's all the time removing, removing, removing. Remove. There is yeah. nothing like by default saying, guy, yeah, remove all the stuff because I'm processing it. Because you have a huge block, you know, matching yeah. fields, stuff. If I forget to delete something, it will leak. Yeah. Like, it's nothing by default to say, unless I specifically pick it up, just delete it. Uh, as far as I know, Logitech cannot do that um, and because it doesn't know. You, ha you have to tell which parts <coughs> of your logging events are sensitive and the only one who knows is you as okay. a developer. Uh, Logitech doesn't know, it can't determine that. So uh, you have to clean up after yourself basically. There was another question, I think. Yeah. For us, how long has it been since something happened in the system until you see that in how long it took before it happened, uh, between the moment it happened and we saw it? Um, well, we had the dashboard refresh every uh, five minutes or so, just to offload the cluster a bit. So, five minutes. Um, but if we uh, were particularly interested and we were zooming in and we would, for example, set the refresh rate to 10 seconds, it would be almost instantaneously uh, visible. But there is some kind of a delay, obviously, because you log to a file, Logstash needs to pick it up, needs to process it, send it to Redis, the other one is to Elastic. So there is a bit of a delay, but usually it wouldn't be that much. You're using uh, the key as part of the uh, to measure both metrics, health metrics, and business metrics. Yeah. Uh, you don't think that you should split them? Sorry? Split them to different stacks or? Um, well, we, next to Elastic, we also had uh, Graphite for the real metrics uh, things. Uh, we, we have been doing that for years and uh, the need was felt bank wide to have some kind of a overall dashboard for what is happening in our internet banking system. And with Graphite, it's very hard to. Uh, store anything else than numbers. In fact, it's not possible. You can only store numbers, so you can, you can um, uh, save the fact that you did a call to a certain system or that you processed something, but you don't know what it was. And it's very hard to, to add this semantics to your metrics. And by using uh, uh, Elasticsearch and Blockstage, we were able to add a lot of uh, meta information to these metrics and, in fact, uh, transform it into a much more useful information. Things like, for example, um, these charts weren't simply possible with metric, uh, with a graphite to build. And it, it did tell us things like, uh, for example, this chart, we expected the green part, uh, part to be much, much smaller. And then we were running this and we were looking at this and it was like, we didn't expect that. We thought that our business data would be divided differently than it appears to be. Um, so, yes, it's, it is, strictly speaking, also a bit of matrix, uh, but, well, we didn't really matter because we were in, interested in what it would tell us and not in how it would get there, if it would be the right system. If, if this did the trick, then it was good for us. And what if you want to <coughs> give the data more, more than one more? Like, you know, this is... Yeah. This is well, you, this is. You, uh, you, you could do that. Um, well, we didn't build the Elastic Cluster ourselves. There was a, an operations team for that. Um, so we would have uh, needed to go to them, buy them like a big pie or something, or a beer, and, and ask them to store it longer. And maybe they would have done it if they had enough disks for that. Um, it, it's not a limitation of Elastic. It's a limitation that you, as a maintainer of the cluster, uh, impose on your, your setup. Any other questions? Apart from the from the dashboard, is there any sort of uh, alerting mechanism? That's a question I get a lot, actually. Uh, is there some kind of an alerting system? And yet, the sad answer is no. Um, we thought about doing it ourselves, like building a Chrome job that would query the dashboard every five minutes and see if something happened and then send an email. We might be able to do so, um, but it's not an elastic. By the way, um, there is, uh, okay, this is a lot of clicking. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yes, 
you could do it with log stash. Because you could do things like, um, if my uh, logging event occurs to be an error, I want to send it by email, for example. Or I want to post it to IRC, or create a gyro, a gyro issue. The bad thing is, if you're having one million customers an hour, you don't want one million emails an hour in your mailbox. So you're going to fight with system operations that don't want to process that big amount of emails. But things like Jira or IRC might be an option, or Navios, for example. Um, so you could do things like that, but it would be a log stack thing, not a log stack thing. More questions? Uh, 
one request. So when we build a dashboard for the last 24 hours, we always hit these two indices. Well, whatever. Uh, we always hit these two indices, uh, like today's index and the one of yesterday. And that's something, at least the version of Elastic we were using, can't handle so very well. And uh, it, it starts doing difficult things as well, okay? So we, we got a lot of questions like, can't you just build a, a dashboard that does it for one index? And, well, the answer was no, because then we would always lose information that occurred past the last mid, uh, before last midnight. So, bad luck, but it's, it's a, it's a time-based and it's a day, so that's why. No more? Okay, well then, thanks for your attention. And <laughs>